All right, Justin, welcome. Thanks for taking the time to chat with us. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor. So Justin's taking some time off his vacation to talk to us today. So I'm, I'm especially grateful um, to have him today. And you know, we've known each other for a number of years, um, and you know, there's always been a great, great relationship. You've been, you know, one of the easiest, kindest customers we've ever worked. So I was very excited to have you here. Oh, thank you so much. It's good to reconnect with you. And we loved working with you. And I have only great things to say about working with Dilly and with awesome. you, of course. Awesome. Well, yeah, thank you for having me. I think, so I think one of the, the easy ways to, to get started in the conversation is always hearing a little bit about your background, like, your, you know, sort of inception story and, you know, maybe go a little bit into like Storecraft over time. But like, how did everything start for you? Yeah, man, that's a good question. I don't really know where to begin. Uh, born and raised in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Uh, pretty international upbringing. I have a very tight knit family, very close with my my family and my parents. And um, I'm very fortunate that my dad brought me along on his uh, business travels when I was growing up. So I got to go see different countries. And uh, what did weather- he do? Like, well, what got him to travel so much? Yeah. Uh, well, my dad grew up, my dad traveled a lot. Um, so when I was little, I was always being told about his stories throughout his uh, young adult years of traveling through Asia and Africa and all these amazing stories of being in these countries uh, in very interesting, sometimes scary situations. And so I guess growing up, I always just had a, a real affinity for learning about different cultures and learning about different countries. And uh, I remember from a really young age, I used to love just like looking at all the flags of the world and being able to name all of the flags. And uh, even today, one of my favorite things to do is just go on YouTube and type in random countries and random cities and just learn about it. I just love meeting people from different cultures and learning about the world. So whether it was philanthropy or business, my dad brought me along with him, which was great. Um, and also when I went to university, uh, I went to the university of Southern California, um, Marshall school of business, and we had a very, very international campus. Um, and also being from Canada, I was in the international student cohort. So all of my close friends were from different countries like Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Kuwait, uh, China, all over. So I just, I just love the world and. I love meeting people with different viewpoints and perspectives and backgrounds. And uh, it's really shaped who I am today. And uh, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. It does. Little... Yeah, no, it does. It's, it's uh, you know, it, when people are from Europe, I feel like by default, they just like go to like 20 different countries because everything's so close here. But, um, but it's incredibly humbling. The more you know, the more cultures you get to experience the more humility you develop because you realize how small you are, right? And how, like, how things are done so differently in different parts of the world. Um, so, you know, I, I couldn't agree more. And it's like, like when you start traveling, stressing other things, you just want to do it more and more. So what an incredible, unfortunate upbringing you had. When, when you went to USC, uh, what happened after? Like, you went to business school, you come out of business school, What does Justin want to do? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I always knew, like, even in high school, I just loved, I was always creative. From a young age, I was, like, making videos and editing videos and designing T-shirts and designing logos. And I remember when I was in high school, I took our uh, graphic design class and I was silk screening shirts and designing my own logos and building websites from a young age. So I just love creativity. And... Um, when I went to USC Marshall, one of the reasons I went there is because in high school, I actually, um, I was fortunate in Canada, you know, we learn English and French, but the high school that I went to, we were able to choose our second language. So I took Mandarin and, um, so I took four years of Mandarin, um, interned in Shanghai, which was great. And, um, USC gave me the opportunity to continue with my with my Chinese, which was great. And also to be able to go to business school and be able to study business classes right from year one. 
And in particular at USC, you're able to choose your concentration at USC Marshall and product and brand management is something that really interested me. Um, I love consumer goods um, as a consumer and also like I love the consumer psychology behind it. Um, I love learning about different brands and how they connect with consumers and make them feel something, the emotional connection to it. So uh, it was great. So I had a wonderful four years at USC. I got to intern for some great, great companies. And coming out of USC, um, I came home, came back to Vancouver and felt a bit lost. Honestly, it wasn't like an easy ride at all. It wasn't like I think I was under the impression that things would be very linear coming out of USC and things would fall into place. Um, but it wasn't like that at all. It was like uh, cold water to the face. And I felt a bit lost, honestly. And um, But I didn't give up. And things just kind of came together. Um, I really wanted to work for a large consumer goods company. I actually had a list in the notes section of my phone with like, these are the dream companies that I want to work for and I need to somehow find a way to get in there. And um, fortunately, I things just came together. I went for coffee with a friend who I was talking to him about, similar to the story I'm telling you right now. And then he said, hey, I know someone that works at L'Oreal and I should connect you guys. I think you would really vibe well. And then he connected me. I told him about my experience and ended up getting my foot in the door with L'Oreal and telling my girlfriend we're packing our bags and moving to Montreal and uh, I'm going to go work for L'Oreal Canada headquarters. And that was the beginning of my journey in the world of product and brands. How was that? I mean, L'Oreal is such an enormous company. Um, what was it like to, to be inside of a machine like that? Like what are some amazing. of the things that you were able to do and maybe some of the things that we were, you were not able to do? Sure. It was amazing. Um, brand new city for me. Um, my mom is from Montreal, but I, I had never been there and um, I'd never worked for a large company like that. And they're just so influential and they own so many brands that I admire yeah. and use. And um, I think it was extra special for me being someone that's so passionate and that puts 100% into everything I do um, to be able to work every day on brands that I actually buy and love and um, vouch for. So that was super cool. And um, I think the best thing coming out of L'Oreal was like just the culture of excellence and uh, the friendships that I made. And I still keep in touch every day with the people that I worked with at L'Oreal. That's amazing. It's yeah, I mean, one of the the things that I often think about when building products and services and like businesses is like, well, the ultimate thing is when you can build something you can use yourself, right? It's like when you're the customer of the, the creations that, that you have. I mean, that's, it's incredible. It, it's like, it, it, it must be an insane feeling. Um, how does, how do you go from cosmetics into kids? I mean, how does this whole transition happen between like, an enormous company like L'Oreal into, you know, at the time, I'm sure like a small startup or like a smaller business um, or even building something almost from the ground up. Yeah, absolutely. So um, first of all, I definitely was in love with my job and I was not ready to leave. Um, also, just on a side note, like that was not easy. Working at L'Oreal was not easy at all because when I got there, um, I knew it was the right fit, but I didn't know too much about what my role would entail. And I found out that a lot of it had uh, to do with coding and I didn't know how to code. And wow. I was faced with the decision where it's like, <laughs> pack up uh, and go home. And, you know, it was nice to meet you, but uh, not the right fit for this job or, all right, um, let's make this work. So I set my alarm for 4 a.m. and uh, signed up for an online coding class and I taught myself. And uh, I think because I was a consumer of L'Oreal and I loved the product so much and I understood the brand and everything, I, I was able to think about it when I was coding. To me, it wasn't just numbers and letters and um, code. It was like actual products and thinking about how I would like to segment the data. So uh, that was awesome. So anyway, the reason I bring that up is because the whole journey there of like teaching myself how to code and work my way up there, all self-taught, um, 
it was hard to leave. So, and also as someone that absolutely loved the industry I was in and loved the brands that I was working with, it was really hard to leave for an industry that I didn't know too much about, which was baby. So it was difficult, but definitely an amazing decision looking back. Um, and I'm really glad that I'm able to bring that passion that I had at L'Oreal to a new industry and a new brand. What was the, what was the trigger? I mean, what was the trigger point to really make you jump? It must have been, like you said, it must have been terrifying. You know, even if your job was difficult, um, what, what was the change? Getting engaged, proposing oh. to a girlfriend, uh, making her my fiance, and we're both from Vancouver. So uh, getting engaged and uh, we're both very, very tight knit with our families and just knowing that ultimately our lives were going to be in Vancouver with our families. It was just, you know, time to look towards the future. And my brother is the president and CEO of Storecraft, and he had taken over pretty soon around the time that I got engaged. And he said that he needed help in the marketing department and um, beefing up the brand and product strategy. And he asked me to join. And uh, yeah, that's how it all came awesome. together. Pretty much. That's, yeah. that's amazing. You, you made a move out of love. <laughs> what a what love. a great reason. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I love that. So where where was the company at that time when you came into it? And where is it today? Like what has changed? What like what did you encounter at the time when you joined and like what are some of the things you've done since then to, to shift the business? Yeah, um the company was uh, like just a bit of background. So my family owned Storecraft. Mm -hmm. They acquired the company in the 90s, I believe. Um, but my brother is the only one that is actively involved in the business and he's given his heart and soul to it. He is Mr. Storecraft. Uh, and I'm just so grateful to be able to work with him because he's an incredible influence on me, an incredible mentor. And he is an amazing boss, but most importantly, he's my best friend and I love him so much. And being able to work with him every day is just such an incredible opportunity for me. And uh, I'm forever grateful for that. So that's one thing. And when I joined the company, um, I would say that Storecraft was in a period of transition because um, now it was under my brother's leadership and him being a young energetic guy with a lot of passion i think he was like shaping the company and ready to position it for growth so i was able to go in there and really give the brand um, a unique voice and a story and storecraft had been around since 1945 when the first storecraft crib was made so yeah i had no idea i thought it was a yeah. national brand in that 1945 so we are we've been around for nearly 80 years but we operate like a startup where things happen quickly we're constantly having our finger on the pulse and we've got so much passion and we're obsessed with innovating and becoming better and adapting and so yeah it was just amazing amazing what was your what was your grain of salt um, that you contributed towards that shift when your brother takes over, brings you on board, as I assume kind of like a head of creative. Uh, what did you feel you had to do to the brand and the product to turn things around and prepare that company for growth? So I think a lot of people knew Storecraft as like a, like a mass market brand maybe not such a strong brand, not something that they could really connect to. More of like didn't a commodity know, product. Almost. Right, a commodity product. Didn't know that we had been around since 1945 and didn't know the great people that we had behind the brand going to work every day, just like in love with what we were doing. And it's such a special industry because I think even for me, when I was faced with the prospect of joining Storecraft and having to leave an industry that I loved, you know, with the glitz and glamour of the consumer goods uh, space of, of cosmetics and makeup yeah. and uh, all the uh, 
all the celebrity names and the glitz and glamour and the beautiful packaging and amazing marketing that goes along with it. I, I, I was just excited because it was an opportunity to take that, that mindset and bring it to a new industry that maybe didn't have that, but there's so much beauty in the baby space because we get to work with families that are preparing their nurseries, getting ready to welcome their child into the world, getting ready to, you know, for the, probably one of the biggest life moments, maybe there's marriage or maybe there's like big uh, milestones in life and definitely bringing a baby into the world or adopting a baby or fostering a baby, but putting that nursery together and making sure that you have a safe crib, a safe nursery that represents the, the vibe that you want your baby to be in. Uh, it's super special. So we wanted to make sure that all families, no matter what their spending power was, was to have a safe, and stylish nursery that they could be proud of no matter what their budget allowed them to have. We wanted to bring that just all of the features and all the bells and whistles from the more prominent players in the space, the ones that not everyone can necessarily afford, but we wanted to make sure that all families could have that and not have to sacrifice on that just because they didn't have the spending power to do that. I think it's incredible. How do you, I mean, my family has owned the business for 90 something years, 93 years, I think. And, you know, it's almost like my entire generation, it's too afraid to take over. Um, in fact, one of the things we're discussing uh, in my parents' generation is to potentially sell the business because um, there really isn't anyone lining up on our, on our uh, age range to kind of take over that. And and the reason being is like, I think most of us see the business as something that is so traditional. I mean, this is like fish oil. Um, and it almost too afraid to feel that we cannot bring our own, our own blueprint or our own touch into the company um, because of the existing tradition and customer base it has. Were you ever afraid that turning the brand around or giving it more of a, less of a commodity product, more of a touch would scare off some of those customers. Man, you ask good questions. Um, I, I don't think so. I think, um, fortunately my brother was very supportive and on board with that. We didn't reinvent anything. Like we stuck with it. We didn't rebrand. Um, but we just, really wanted to give ourselves a soul. And the good thing is we built amazing relationships with a lot of the parents that were uh, part of the hashtag Storecraft family and showcasing their own nurseries. And like we built authentic, organic, genuine relationships with them and really got a feel for what families want and what they like about us and what they admire about us. And I think that having that genuine connection with the families that were actually trusting us with their nurseries and with their kids' bedrooms, we weren't really just listening to an agency that was telling us what to do or telling us how to brand it and what they see. We really had that feeling on our own and we knew what our families liked about us and what we built was really based off of that that IQ that we had and that strong relationship we had with them. So we didn't really do anything that was too risky, but it was like, I cannot express enough how needed it was for us to give Storecraft that voice and for people to really understand the passion and the pride behind that brand. Because otherwise, I mean, it's just a crib, but I want them to know that the first crib was made in 1945, that we absolutely love what we do. We, invest so much into the safety of the product and the design and the features and uh, making sure it's convenient for parents. So I think that we didn't do any household changes, but just really rolled out things gradually to let people know who we were. I love that. It's almost like there has been this underlying story and soul that's always been a part of the business, but maybe it didn't find its way into the customer. And and you took the existing soul and then brought it out and put it in front of the customer. Um, and you know, I, I'm sure in your experiences in L'Oreal, there are just so many products today. 
I mean, for everything, there's like a hundred different options. I'm sure for crates, for cosmetics, moisturizers, doesn't matter what you buy. There's like a hundred different companies trying to sell you that one product. Um, how do you think about long-term differentiation? I mean, bringing out the story of the brand, it's, it's one way, right? But how do you sustain that for the next 10 years? Like how does Starcraft continue to be something unique in the space of, you know, uh, or in the moment where people think about having children? Yeah, well, I think just like I said, um, having those genuine bonds and connections with the families using our products and getting that feedback and understanding what they like, what they want to see improved, what they missed from it, and really taking that into the product development process. I think that understanding what our customers want rather than telling them what they want, that's really important for product development. I think it's important for us to always see and be ahead of the game on like what colors are trending and what wood tones are trending. And um, I think that it's important not to do things that are too out of the box. Um, I wouldn't really want us to take a huge risk and introduce something that's very unproven, but I think that it's important to always innovate and always be better and better and better, you know, whether that's, uh, you know, right now we have one of our reclining nursery chairs that has a USB in it. But then now some of the smartphones are using a different USB. So immediately just updating it to that new USB, right? Like things to always stay current. Mm -hmm. I think it's so important every day to just like not even be caught up in our own industry. Like, yeah, we're in baby, but I want everyone in our company to look around at what the best brands in the world are mm -hmm. doing. Like what, what is, what is cool? What, how are people touching on their consumers and making people feel special and really understanding? Like, I, I, we know whether it's in something that's completely unrelated to what we're doing. I still like to see what the best of the best are doing. And I want us to be the best of the best. I want us to develop that emotional connection with the families. So, you know, whether it's like, you know, in the food and beverage space or the sports space or anything, like, I just want to see you what's what's going on that's great and how can we be one of the greats as well have you thought about other products other product lines like in the future I mean, this might be proprietary so you don't have to tell me <laughs> but uh but are there categories that you find interesting that maybe are kind of semi adjacent to what you guys are already doing that you think would be important in the future i think anything that is within the core of making families lives happy and bringing dream nurseries to life and dream kids bedrooms to life and if it's uh if it's a product line that we're not currently in but that could be complementary to what we're doing i think that's super exciting because of course like we want to we want to update the designs within the categories that we're currently in but i also want to expand and do something mm -hmm. that we aren't doing and if we can get add-on products, then that would be a huge win for us and for the families that we're devoted to serving. How do you how do you think about you know this is a bit more of a, a business I guess question, but how do you think about distribution? You know, so much of like how a brand comes across online at least is like you have a website, you have advertising, you have the different kind of online marketplaces like Amazon. You guys are big on Amazon. Um, how do you, outside of that online connection, how do you bring that into retail? Like if you go on, like, how do you bring that brand and that story and so on when you're in a display somewhere versus like you have a chance to show a 30 second video to someone? Yeah, um, I think a great example of that is, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with a retailer in Canada, but it's called Indigo. Very mm -hmm. cool, very cool store. We love it. It started as a, as a bookstore, um, but they've since expanded to a lifestyle retailer, very nice stores. And they've been really, I don't know, uh, innovating with their Indigo Baby offering. And we're so proud that um, the Indigo Baby location in Vancouver, uh, one that I grew up shopping at, uh, they have a new Indigo Baby store and they put um, some of our products in the store, which is amazing. So now parents that get to go, they get to touch and feel our products and um, they get 
actually to scan a QR code and shop the product online. They get to learn a little bit about the brand history, the fact that we've been around since 1945, the fact that our products are designed not just to be disposable pieces of nursery furniture, but to really grow with the child from baby all the way to childhood. So I think getting into retail stores where customers can really feel our product and having those point of purchase displays that tell the brand story and have things like QR codes and have things like letting people know our brand history and have things like visuals to let them know that it's not just a crib, but it also turns into a toddler bed and also turns into a bed. Anything we can do to be creative and visual, but also not overload the consumer with too much information, it's a big win. And um, of course, when we have retailers like Indigo and like others that are willing to also invest into store displays that speak to our brand story and speak to how convenient this product is, then it's a good recipe for success. You, you brought up an interesting point um, around kind of the, I'm not sure how exactly you phrase it, but like the, the product life cycle and how it kind of grows through the childhood. Um, one of the questions I always have with, with baby products and, and, and products that kids outgrow in a relatively short period of time is uh, around recirculation. So, like, have you given any thought to what happens when the, when the child outgrows the product? Um, how do you think about Because a lot of them, I'm sure, are going to be in a really good state, uh, you know, undamaged and so on. Like, how do you think about bringing those things back into being used maybe by other families that, that couldn't afford the product in the first place. Like, have you guys given it any thought or, or do you even know where these, these crates end up after the kids outgrow them? Well, every crib we design is convertible, everything. So some of our cribs are, they transform into a toddler bed. And then mm -hmm. after a toddler bed, it can be used as a day bed, meaning like, you know, something uh, like a sofa for the kids' room, essentially, something to sit on and read and just relax on. Um, and then other cribs that we make transform from the crib into a toddler bed, a day bed, and a full-size bed. So you just buy the conversion kit and it can turn into a full-size bed, you know, like a double mattress. That's amazing. So that's great. And also... Um, we have some, you know, all of our changing tables. Once the baby is moved on to the toddler stage, go ahead and use that changing table as a bookshelf. It looks beautiful as that. And um, our six drawer double dressers, you can buy the topper to put on and it fits the changing pad. So it can be like a multi-use changing station. But then when the baby is a toddler, just remove the topper and you have a perfectly fine dresser. And um same, we have this convertible changing table and the changing topper comes off and then it's just a perfectly good bookshelf and toy bin. So everything we design, we have in mind longevity and conversion and just convenience and multi-use and multi-purpose. We don't want families to get rid of our products just when the baby grows. You know, we want this furniture to work for them for a long, long time. I love that. I had no idea you did that. You guys did that. I think it's fascinating. So basically you're continuously repurposing um, the crib and like ev evolving and as, as, as the family grows, as the needs change, the product is evolving with that. That is fascinating. We're also really excited to launch a new brand that we've started a sub brand called Storecraft Next. And that's for everything that comes next after the nursery years. So that whole idea of longevity and multi-purpose furniture doesn't just stop with the nursery, but even with the beautiful bunk beds that we have, they're convertible. We have a bunk bed, uh, twin over twin, but it converts into two separate twin beds. So, you know, use it as a bunk bed or use it as two twin beds, put one twin bed in one room, one twin bed in the other room, uh, switch it up. And we also have some other bunk beds coming out that I can't speak to, but they're even more convertible than that. And uh, we're super excited to get those into the homes of families that are going to be part of that Storecraft Next journey. You know, I, I wanted to, um, I love that. I, I'm so impressed by that answer. I really wasn't expecting that level of thought and care around recirculating, up upgrading, and kind of upcycling products. But um, one of the interesting and this is a bit more on the personal side, but 
uh, interesting podcast I listened to the other day with a, a guy called Chris Williamson. Uh, he mentioned statistic that said uh, by 2030, so in about seven years, um, 50% of women between the ages of 25 to 44 uh, will be single, unmarried, and, and with no no children, no families. Um, for you, you know, and I mean, it doesn't take a genius for for someone to see kind of the trend. Is I'm sure on the male side is very similar, right? Like because if those women are going to be single, there's likely a male counterpart is uh, also going to be single, or or a female counterpart is going to be single. That you know, a family is not going to be created. You engage and interact with families all the time, and you see kind of the changes that having children, adopting children, fostering children brings into those families and like the positive side of it. Um, what do you think the impact is going to be? I mean, forget about just the business, like whether you sell more or less, but society at large um, of like a massive reduction in, in family creation, if you will. So it's a tough know. one. It's, it's a, a tough, tough question. I wanted to send you a, a curveball. Um, yeah. But... It is a tough one. I have my own thoughts, but I'd love to hear if, if you've given it any thought. I'm sure you've heard stats like that at some point. I guess uh, I've heard some, I've heard information leaning towards the other way that there's going to be more babies coming out of the pandemic years. And um, I'm not really sure, honestly, how to answer that. I, I'm not going to even try to make up an answer other than like, you know, we just, are gonna, no matter what happens, no matter what happens with the birth rate, the way it goes, whether it's up or down, we're just gonna continue to pour our heart and our passion and our energy into making just amazing, convertible, safe and stylish furniture for the families that are having kids, whether it's adopting, fostering, um, having their own children and, uh, I don't know, wh whatever happens with the birth rate, it's out of our control. So we're just going to keep focused on being the best we can be and just serving the families that we love so much to serve. I love that. Um, you know, another, I want to throw another curveball, another personal curveball. I saw on LinkedIn, um, your philanthropy, some of your philanthropy work. Um, what, what brought you into that in the first place? And, and what are some of the things that you've done that you're doing in that space. And I, I, the reason why I want to highlight this is because I think it's so important that you're also displaying that facet of your life, not just professionally successful, but also um, thinking beyond that and, and thinking about others in that way. Well, it's something that is ingrained in my family since my grandfather, Joe Siegel, who um, we lost last year. And he was an amazing philanthropist, uh, such a giving individual of his time, of his expertise, of course, of his finances, but his time and his heart. And I think uh, that definitely passed on to my father and my father's siblings. And that was passed on to me and my siblings. And just growing up around philanthropy and around people giving back always, it's just part of our upbringing. And uh, genuinely something that I love doing. And I was fortunate with my life partner, with my wife, Yael, she shared with those values. And it's just the greatest thing in the world to do things to get the community together and get people together for causes that really touch on our heartstrings and that we're proud to be able to support. And I guess it's a wonderful creative outlet for me as well, because I've always been a creative and being able to do things like, um, you know, recently I designed some shirts and I uh, did a fundraiser. So being able to see people walking around or playing in tennis tournaments, wearing shirts that I've designed and knowing that those shirts are going to support uh, kids that are at these uh, tennis centers, these at-risk youth. Uh, it's just the best feeling in the world, not just being a creative and seeing people rocking our shirts, but also knowing that it's going to a great cause and it's going to change lives. And I just absolutely love being able to help others. And I'm very grateful every day, every day. I'm just so grateful for my health and the situation that I'm in that I just never lose sight of being able to use the tools that I have to bring happiness and, and help to people that are in need of it, wherever they are in the world, whether it's local or international, I just, it's what fuels me. It's what drives me. And 
I, I just love it. And we're doing the same with Storecraft. You know, I had a, uh, had a lovely organization come to the office and they're building a, a home in East Vancouver for women that are in need, you know, single women that are in need of help and in need of a safe place. It's a maternity safe ward. And they asked if we could help them with outfitting their nurseries. And I mean, absolutely. That's what we're all about at Storecraft. It's about bringing dream nurseries and kids' bedrooms to life. And if we are in a position to be able to utilize what we are doing and what we are pouring our heart and soul into manufacturing to help families in need that otherwise wouldn't have a safe nursery, a safe place to put their baby, a place to feel safe in the comfort of their own nursery, man, we're going to do it. We're, we're 100%. We're all in. So I can't wait to help them. We have amazing charity partners and we're just so fortunate to be able to give our products to be able to help families in need. And we're going to do more of it. And um, I can't wait for some great partnerships and initiatives for the rest of the year and onwards. So touching listening to you speak about that and how you think about impact beyond just building a business. Um, I think the legend is true that Canadians are the nicest people ever. <laughs> uh, where where can people find out more about you about your philanthropy work about storecraft well definitely check out storecraft.com and we're available for purchase from your favorite online retailers in the u.s and canada and um i guess if you want to learn more about my philanthropy work it's justin and yael y-a-e-l familyfund.com and you can learn more about what my wife and i are up to through our philanthropy work and of course on storecraft you can go and look at the uh, organizations that we work with as well so um, and also make sure to follow us on your social media channel of choice for Storecraft and we've got some amazing new designs coming out and some amazing charitable initiatives. And we just can't wait to help out more families. And we hope that whoever's watching this one day, if you decide to start your own family, that you'll consider Storecraft. Um, Justin, yeah. thank you so much, man. Uh, it, it's been great catching up. It's been great listening to, to the story. It's fascinating to hear how Storecraft is actually an almost 80 year old company. <laughs> 